Welcome to a Celtic State of Mind, not your usual host today, not Paul John Dykes, but it's Colin Watt, and I'm absolutely delighted to be joined by the Hollywood superstar Gianni Capaldi. Gianni, how are you? Um, I've been better, but I'm good. (laughs) (laughs) Healthy's good. It's a bit of an awkward situation we're finding ourselves in at the moment, so how are you and the family coping? I I hear you're still in Scotland. I am, yeah. I just, with the whole um, flight shut down to the States and with the kids, I just didn't want to, there's no direct flights to Vegas right now, so Mm. um, I just didn't want to drag the family through different airports and whatnot so just waiting for that to open and get a direct flight home at least the weather's not been too bad over here we've been enjoying some nice weather lately so it's not quite vegas weather but it's it'll do for a it's while it's brilliant somebody said to me this morning says oh do you look tanned i've not seen you look tanned for a while and, and i was thinking it must be the scottish sun then i've got it all wrong so what do you think the current situation regards scottish football i mean it looks as if celtic's going to be given the title which to be fair, they've absolutely deserved, um, considering we're 13 points clear. There's Rangers fans going on about how they could cut the gap, gap to four, but to be honest, the way we were playing, I would have fancied us to, to beat them at Ibrox and at Celtic Park, so I think we've been we've been done out of that chance as well. I mean, to be honest with you, you know, when we put everything in perspective, football should always take a second place to, you know, human life and endangering putting people at risk. Um, but the reality is, is you know, merit is rewarded, and you know, the same as it is in England with the Premier League, and Liverpool thoroughly deserve it, and you know, so many points clear. Yes, not mathematically champions yet, and neither are we. But the reality is, if you were to call it short now, then then that's just that's the way the land lies. We are 13 points clear. Even if Rangers were to win theirs, we're still double double digits clear. Yep. I don't know why Rangers are making such a noise because you know it actually makes me want to play out the championship behind closed doors um even though i think that's endangering the players lives um you know it, it, it's just just to shut them up because they've made such a fuss and you know what would happen is if if it was to be played and someone did get sick and then other players get sick and it happened to juventus it's happened to many teams yep. um down at man city down at, you know all throughout europe it's happened to many teams um, Real Madrid they had players that have been sick and you know the reality is if some some was to go wrong and you know hopefully it doesn't then that would fall on Rangers heads and and I, I, I can't understand why they're so engrossed in themselves and and not even taking that responsibility you know it's like a decision for me not to fly my family home through different airports because I don't want to I don't want to take that risk on them and it would be on me um, having to go extra airports so the same would go for Rangers. If they want to start putting players at risk, you know, they would have to take responsibility if anything went went wrong. You know, and, and you're right, we you know, I don't know if we would have won it. Nobody has a crystal ball, but I would imagine I don't see the points, you know, getting any less than the, the ten or the thirteen once everything's played out. Um, you know, I think it would just even up. I'm sure we'd beat them at Parkhead and you know, whatever there is the score was at Ibrox. I mean I was going in there quite buoyant that day before, even though I thought there was no chance of us playing it because of the coronavirus. Yeah. And I was really shocked, actually, for Sturgeon to allow Rangers Europa League tie to get played because, you know, the, the Liverpool game was on the night before and I had folk from Italy messaging me saying, I couldn't believe it, you know, how teams are actually still playing and fans are still together. It's just a complete disregard for what was happening. And, and I think... There's a strong case right now because there's a the surge in the coronavirus happened in Liverpool, believe it or not, and blame it on that Athletic Madrid game. You know, so and I think that's what happened with Atlanta when they played the Spanish team as well. So uh, you know, sport sport was put first and it shouldn't have. But absolutely, Celtic thoroughly deserve it. And you know, we and it's a true championship. They can't say it's eight and a half or eight and three quarters or whatever they're saying. This is this is nine. We deserve it. They should hand it out, and that's it. And the Scottish Cup semi-finals, play them next. You know, once everyone settles down, we play them, and then that's it. And then get rid of that, and we'll get our, we'll get our next treble, and then start the new season. 
you were brought, brought up in up Hamilton, Hamilton. Um, in the early 70s, so where did the connection to Celtic begin? Hamilton's quite a Celtic town. I don't know if you know that. It's planted right in the middle between um, Lark Hall and, and um, Burnbank, so very Celtic town, so you kind of follow the trend, I guess. But um, I went to my first game. I remember the guy who took me, actually, uh, my first Celtic game, and then um, it just went on from there, and that was it. No recollection of who we played at the time. I remember the day out, put it that way. We were speaking about this in a, a podcast not that long ago. My first Celtic game, I don't remember a lot about it, but it was when Larson came back from his leg break and he needed to play the 20 minutes to make the Euro 2000 squad. And I, I managed to find a video of the, of the game on YouTube and I could not remember a single part apart from when Larson comes off the bench because the roar was as if we'd knocked five past Rangers at Parkhead. It was incredible. Celtic were through and goal. Nobody was paying attention. All they noticed was Henrik Larson was coming onto the park. So that's what sticks in my mind. So we're talking sort of the seventies. Did you get to games regularly back then? Uh, no, it was a, it would be the eighties. It was well, it, well into the eighties. I'm aging you there. That's terrible. Uh, no, it was well into the. It must have been probably mid to late eighties, mid eighties. Have been the sort of Davy Hay. And to um, Billy McNeil's second spell then? Probably, yeah. Yeah, no, I remember David Hay. But uh, I, it was definitely mid to late 80s. So who was your sort of Celtic hero at that point when you were growing up? Uh, I think I always, first player I kind of really liked and stood by was probably Paul McStay, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, but I do remember that, you know, the Provins and the McLeods and, you know, um, I think Paul McStay was Mr Celtic, wasn't he? He just, he never really ventured out and, he was happy to be, he was content um, and he, you know, his, he saw great, he saw Celtic as a great club and I don't think he just, for him, he felt he was where he wanted to be and I think with Paul McStay, he was just, I'll never forget that goal, I think he scored for Scotland, it was like, you know, 40 yards out or something, he just belted it, tremendous, but no, Paul McStay, I think was definitely somebody that I, I kind of looked up to at that point. And it's an, an absolute legend of a, a Celtic player. And as you said, he was sort of there through some of the good times and quite a lot of the bad times at Celtic. And his loyalty is probably one of the things that, that puts him into that sort of legendary status as well. But you were a bit of a player yourself, were you not? I was reading up on you and apparently you played for Motherwell. Can you fact check that? And I, it's, no, it's true. I went with Motherwell. It was actually a guy called Dave. Uh, do you remember Davy Cooper? Yes, I remember Davy Cooper, yep. Davy and, you know, Davy was a Hamilton man. And uh, and I know he played with Rangers, but I had utmost respect for Davy Cooper. I thought he was a he was a sound guy. He wasn't a a bitter guy. He was you know he wasn't what some of the Rangers players we don't want to mention on this because <laughs> <laughs> ended up running into them or something. But um, no, he Davy was a was definitely a sound guy, and his his family were good people and everyone. But um, he brought me into uh, Muddle because he was at Muddle at the time, mm-hmm. and, and the the coach down here at the time was Tam Forsyth and. Yeah, I started with a boys club and, and uh, I stayed there till I was about 17 or 18, I think. And then that was it. Kind of called it a day then and didn't work out and, and, and that was it. So, end of my football <laughs> career at that point. <laughs> but it was good. I enjoyed it at the time, you know. It was it was good. Good crack. But I, I can't, it's funny because after you, you don't, when you're young and football is your life, you, you kind of give everything all the time with football and, you know, you, you don't do a lot of things because of football and then once it doesn't, work out you kind of never want to kick a ball again if that makes sense yeah um so like i kind of like i wouldn't want to play anymore and that would be you, you kind of lose the drive and mm-hmm. right up on with it and that's it you know do you want to go play with your pals no not really you know and that was that so but i, I played the odd game but you kind of just lost the passion for it i think it's more a, it was more a disappointment than anything but you know everyone happens for a reason was there anybody that was part of your setup that actually did go on to make it um, a few of the boys, uh, there was a few of the boys uh, from Muddle that did quite well. Mate, now I'm going back 25 years now, so <laughs> I'm jogging my memory for the morning. <laughs> but there was a few that few a few of the club that stayed on in my Muddle, I remember. When I've kind of looked back, certainly since I've been following football, it, it seems to be there's quite a bit of a, a football hotbed run about the Motherwell Hamilton area. You look at the likes of McCarthy and McArthur that came through at Hamilton. That's right. Motherwells seem to have quite a good youth system as well. So, so I mean, it, it's no surprise that you're saying that there's some of the the guys that went on to make it. And they, you know, they keep coming up with these players, you know, and and they'll sell them for a few million, and then that'll keep them taking over. And you know, they're always there or thereabouts. And they are. A, I went to the the first went to Celtic Celtic Motherwell Celtic game this year. Uh, at the start of the season I was there um, 
and they're always a tough. They're always, they always seem like a tough team to beat when they're playing at home. We did beat them that this time round, but yep. they're, they're always quite plucky. You know what I mean? They're almost like, and we've had so many great games there. Do you remember the four three game we had there? Was, um, Tommy Rogic scored the winner. <laughs> I mean, what a day! Oh, immense. You know, an absolute immense, and it was like constant back and forth, back and forth. You know, and they, they just have this self belief about them. And they've, and they've caused Rangers problems over the years as well. Um, you know, so it's been one of those teams that have been in the old firm's, you know, a thorn on the old firm's side kind of thing. Um, like Kilmarnock kind of thing, you know, they've always had that pluckiness about them. But, aye, they've done well and they sustain themselves. But, you know, Hamilton's a wee bit different. They've not quite, they've not reached that level when they're, you know, they, they struggle just to stay in the Premier League, but they're a completely different level than, than Madola. They always seem to find a way to stay up, mind you. You look at it, and even as it was getting towards the end of this season, they were pulling out some some brilliant results, like beating Rangers and uh, drawing with Hearts. And it's those kind of results that keep them up year after year. That's right. They just find uh, their, their, their crap for so long, and then just suddenly <laughs> they just do what they have to do just to scrape by. Um, but... Uh, good. It's good to see two Lanarkshire teams in the Premier League. You know. You can I say you lost your kind of love for football around the 18. What was your next steps? How did it go from playing for Motherwell to to moving out to the States? Uh, well, it wasn't. I don't think I moved out till I was about 27. I moved out to LA. Mm-hmm. Time I think it was 27 or 28, and um, I moved out and uh, I went to um, acting school out there, and um, didn't know anyone when I moved out. Just moved out my own. And uh, loved LA. LA was, it was honestly, it was like heaven. <laughs> Being out, <laughs> blissful, you know, sunny. Everybody was positive, attitude. Um, it was just, you know, you'd fall in love at every street corner. Honestly, I can't. It was amazing. <laughs> yeah. um, but uh, I you know I really enjoyed it, and you know, I made some good acquaintances and pals out there. And then I just, I didn't know what to come back and. Uh, I ended up staying out there. Uh, I was in drama school for about three years out there, and then um, booked my first job. And um, and then from there on, I just it became it, it just became clear that you know that's where I, my destiny was. And mm-hmm. it was hard to be away from your family, obviously. Um, and I would come back every year. I've always come back to see my my grandparents. Um, I've always made the effort to come back and see them. Um, every year since I left, and I always, I've only missed one Christmas, you know, and I always say that, I always say to my missus, you know, I never know, my, my grand was 93, my grand's 84, so I, I never want to disappoint them, so I always, you know, they, they kind of always ask, you know, come home for Christmas, son, come home for Christmas, Yeah. so, you know, I always make the effort, I drag my family out all the time for, for, for Christmas, even though, and now she says, oh, but with my family for Christmas and we can have a, a rule where we do Thanksgiving which is like uh, November yep. in the States end of November and then we'll come home for Christmas and then um, and then that'll be that and then like it's the best of both worlds for both but um, I only missed one Christmas and that was just because of a, a visa issue at the time that I couldn't leave but uh, I, as hard as it was I just I knew that was where I had to be and and then um, it was plain sailing from there on. You've, you've had an absolutely fantastic career stateside. Um, do you say it's been about 18 years now you've been abroad? And some of the films and the shows and even the actors and actresses you've worked with. I was reading about you the other day and they were saying that Gianni Capaldi's the, the B-movie superhero that you've never heard of before. I know, it's and crazy. I, it was a, I thought that was a bit harsh. I mean, there's some of the guys that you've worked alongside and some of the films you've been in have been brilliant. But when you're kind of working with these guys... What is it like just because you said you've had, you had three years um, training and then going into work with these um, sort of actors and actresses that have been staples of the screen for years? Was it was it a daunting experience? It was. I mean, the first, well, at first, at first it was, you know, um, I remember one of the first movies I did was for Sony and it was a movie called The Cross. And it, and there was one that you could, you know, like one of those, I think it was out, it came out, it came out in like Sky movies and then it was yeah, yeah. in your you know, your DVDs, like your HMVs and your eyes just had the, the DVDs and all that. But, you know, you turned up turned up and set and it was Tom Sizemore, uh, Michael Clark Duncan, who uh, passed away, and Vinnie Jones at the time, who was hot at the time. 
Brian Austin Green, who was Megan Fox's, you know, that's when I met Megan. Like, you know, you walk in and Brian's like, oh, let me introduce you to my wife. And I'm like, all right. And it's <laughs> Megan Fox, you're like that, going, all right, all right, Meg. <laughs> you know, and it was, it was a bit, you know, you're, you're, you're standing there and you're, you're like, ah, oh, jeez. You know, you, it's a bit of a reality check kind of thing, but you're shaking like a leaf, you know, and remember, I, my first scene was with Vinny uh, on the set and, and uh, I was the only other British guy, you know, on that movie. And then, so, and VG had said to the, the director, he's like, you know, I, I don't want to talk to anyone. I just go want to just come do my stuff and then back to my trailer kind of thing. But then when we were filming, we started to, he goes, oh, you know, sweaty sock. Oh, sweaty sock, sweaty sock, he kept calling me. <laughs> and then we started talking about football and that, so... You know, we became pals that very first day, and uh, you know, and it, it was football that kind of, you know, it's, everybody's got to have something in common, and mm-hmm. the common denominator was football. So we started talking about football and that, and then you know, obviously, the American can understand what football was, so yep. that's how we connected. But you're no, you're right. It, it takes a wee minute just to, but now, now you just, you know, after so many years, you kind of just turn up, you do your work. And, you get on with it and then move on to the next job, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I mean, one of your most recent films or um, pieces of work was actually going back and doing Robert the Bruce. What was that like to kind of play a Scotsman? Eh, uh, always, the accent was not hard to get. <laughs> I didn't have to work on it. Uh, I, Robert the Bruce, it was funny because um, I was supposed to play someone else in it. And then just with dates and everything, like, that movie kept getting pushed and pushed and pushed and pushed. And and then it uh, dates didn't work out and all that. And then he says, right, um, well, we're, we're going off to film Montana now. We're, then we'll go back to Scotland for a few days to film. But could you just come and do this? I says, I absolutely, no problem. Angus McFadden's a good mate of mine. And, mm-hmm. um, you, know, I, you know, I'd turn up from any, anywhere. Um, so I says absolutely. So came back to Scotland, uh, which was great to come work for a few days. It was only two or three days work, mm-hmm. and um, it, it was just good because I got a chance to see my family as well. So if anybody ever offers you a job in Europe, you kind of say yes all the time because then you you know you always make a pit stop and see the family. Then you know off you go again. But it was good. It was good to be part of. Uh, it's a, you know it's a, it was a small part, and um, it's funny because Daniel Portman from um, Game of Thrones, who plays Podrick in Game of Thrones. He yep. uh, was another Celtic fan. They, they had asked him as well if he wanted to come do something in Scotland, but there wasn't much left to film, so they're like, right, how do we do this? And sat down and said, right, well, Johnny, we'll, 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 we'll create two characters and we'll, we'll, we'll split things. You do this and let Daniel do that, and Daniel, let Johnny do this, and, and we kind of split the same role into two. It was kind of weird, but, um, you know, it was all fun and Fun and games and and um, aye, it was good. It was, it was good. Good crack to come back and do some work in your 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 home country. And you mentioned Daniel there being a, a Celtic fan. What I have noticed following you is that you you do manage to to work on some of your big co-stars to to get them to support Celtic. I mean, there's seen pictures of you with Randy Couture and Ron Perryman, Luke Hemsworth. How do you, how does that come about when you're you're on set? Do you, do you just bring the Celtic top with you and just hope for the best, or um, is it easy enough to convince the guys that Celtic's the team for them? Well, it's funny because uh, I've got I end up wearing like I've got so many you know tracky tops or hoodies and whatnot, Celtic hoodies and Celtic <laughs> trackies and that um, tracky tops. So a lot of times you'll just wear it's obviously casual you're wearing when you're out and you're you know so. For instance, like I was in when we were out, I was in Kentucky for about four weeks doing a movie called River Runs Red, mm-hmm. um, and it's a really good film. And it was with uh, Luke Hemsworth and uh, John Cusack was in it as well. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, I sat with John Cusack and gave him a Celtic cap and that, and and the bag. I don't know if you remember the Celtic bags when you bought them. The Celtic bag, I think it had. Uh, 67 cup so like I'd sat down and explained to him that this was the first team at the UK to win the European and it's all about history 
So for someone like John Cusack, that's the kind of thing. It's it's a his, a history thing, and you know, and they kind of take a, a shine into it and that. And then uh, we look as well. Look, had kind of heard of Celtic, but uh, Hemsworth was was a was an easier convert. But, <laughs> No, I think it's. I mean, you, if you're if you're telling somebody about a great product, then it's it's easier for them to like them. Yep. Um, Ron Perlman had said that Tommy Flanagan had mentioned Celtic to him before, but um, not really in great detail. So uh, when he got his scarf, he was he was happy that was his first scarf. But and then Big Randy, Randy lives in Vegas, so we worked on a movie uh, that again I think it came out in like 2014, 2013. It was called Hard Rush. And then we just became good pals after that movie. And um, that's another one. It's a decent one to watch, but, you know, obviously it's seven years old now. So but uh, I, so he'd come up to the house for, for dinner and, and he knows all about Celtic and, you know, he follows my Twitter. So, he, you know, I keep my Twitter just for Celtic, I think. But, uh, <laughs> he's, uh, you know, he, he knows all about Celtic. And so when we got him his top with Couture on the back, he was delighted to give him it. He came for dinner and he got his top so, um, but I, even Danny Glover got his. We were Danny and I were doing a movie in Turin in Italy. Uh-huh. Uh huh. It was just Danny, myself, and uh, I think that was it. Only two folk from America get flown in, and in um, and, and you know, so we're stuck in a hotel for a few weeks. So you know, I'm watching Celtic on the the laptop, <laughs> watching the games when I can, and so um, I got a, a scarf sent over for it. And then they gave me his scarf. It was his birthday out there. Ah. Oh. So he got his scarf for his birthday. It's his best best birthday present he got. <laughs> it's it's brilliant. I mean, as you say, you keep your, your Twitter dedicated to Celtic and just going through it and seeing some of the people that um that you've worked with and them them all converting to Celtic. It's it's absolutely brilliant. Somebody that you've you've actually got a good friendship with that you didn't need to convert to Celtic is someone that's quite local to here and it's Martin Comston. Uh, from what I've heard, you don't stay too far away from each other. No, it was Martin's fault I moved to Vegas, to be honest with you. Because <laughs> uh, he, he lived, it's funny because in LA you live, you could live three miles away from each other but it can take half an hour to get there with traffic. So, you know, but he, um, once he moved to his own place, uh, he moved in with his missus at the time and um, they got a place and it's three miles away but with traffic at Laurel Canyon it's just a, a nightmare sometimes but uh, he said to us, he phoned us up and says listen, should we all move to Vegas? And I'm thinking Vegas? I was like, why Vegas? And then his missus obviously comes from Vegas, she was oh. from Vegas and um, and there's an interesting story there as well how he met his missus at we were out for a drink one just up the street from my house she worked I was kind of trying to play matchmaker that night but <laughs> yeah. anyway so he says go well, move to Vegas and I was like I says I don't know but maybe because my missus at the time we just had a baby and um, my house in LA is in West Hollywood and mm-hmm. it's not really a family place so we were kind of thinking about moving but we didn't consider Vegas at all but anyway so he says well why don't we meet me at the airport and we'll fly out the night and we'll go look at houses in the morning. So I was like, my missus is making the dinner. I'm like, I should lift them off to Vegas. And she's like, what? I'm like, my aunt wants us to go look at houses. So is that all right? She said, let me check first. So is that all right? And she says, I need to go. So, so we went out and, you know, we were good boys that night, just a couple of drinks. And then the next day we started looking at houses and um, I really liked it. It was nice. It was it was suburban where we live, and and um, I and so we both went out. We both saw houses we liked. Um, I went back. I, brought, I took the missus out to look at a house that I found. He took his missus out, um, and we both put offers on houses. And the funny story is is that my offer got accepted. His fell through. So we, I'm in escrow with a house. <laughs> he's at, so he's like, puts another offer in another house and it falls through. Now my house is closing, right? <laughs> and, uh, his missus says, Martin, we're having no luck. Maybe we should just hold off for a bit. And he's like, you know, well, we fuck. <laughs> because <laughs> Johnny just bought a house there. <laughs> we can't just no, no buy a house now. So, uh, 
so I know. So the next one he got, which I think was the best one he tried, it was really really nice, and and um, he got that one, and and that was it. And but only you know a few miles up the roads, but it takes about eight minutes to get to each other's house, ten minutes to get to each other's house most, and there's no traffic. And it's just nice, calm, calm drive, and uh, we have a local wee, you know, chicken wine spots, and you know where we go for a happy hour or where we watch the football and. Things like that. It's, it's really good. We have our own wee joint, so um, I really like it. It's really family orientated out there. My neighbours mm. are brilliant. You know, we've all got pools in our backyard, so you know, it's just a, it's it's better. It's just LA's too, it's too much in your face all the time, and everybody's just wanting to know. Everybody's in the industry, so everybody's just wanting to know what you're working on and what you're doing, and you know, and it, and it's a bit of a rat race out there, whereas. You know, next door to me, I've got a teacher, and across the street, I've got, you know, an ex-cop, and and it's just it's more normal, and I and I like that, and I, he likes that too. You know, it's just where we're from, it's from, it's just more down to earth. That yeah. makes sense. It, it does. It sounds more sort of like being back home, just kind of living in normality. But I mean, it's I guess it's it's still not normality because how would a typical game day work for the two of you guys? I mean, you're what five hours behind, six hours behind. We're eight hours behind. Eight? Oh, jeez. Well, let's say this. The, the last... I remember the one of the old fun games, and it was a 4 a.m. kickoff for us, which is noon, was noon out here. And uh, I think it was the one... I can't remember. I'm sure we... I think we won it. We won 2-1. And uh, 4 a.m., so I says to him, I says, do you want to... Like, should we go out at, like, 7? 7, 7 o'clock? <laughs> and he's like... He says, no. It's to be out at 7 o'clock. We'll never make it. So he's like, right, meet me at midnight or 12 30 it was or midnight or something so we went out at midnight and we met at like our local our local casino is called the red rock mm-hmm. so it's, uh, it's more for locals it's in Summerlin. it's, it's away for the strip and all that so um so we met there we had a few drinks select talks were on and uh, and you know had a wee roll of the dice and just for pass the time and a few drinks and then you know you you get you get ready for the game and then back to mine and then I've got like a in my house I've got a a, a basement which is like a movie theatre mm-hmm. so we get in the basement you know we don't and if you're watching in the basement you, you don't hear you can't hear you upstairs um, so we just watch it down there and then uh, the neighbour actually came and joined us and uh, <laughs> and it was brilliant it was just you know that's that that's how we watch a 4 a.m. game. Now, I don't know if we get up at 4 a.m. We wouldn't do that if we're playing, you know, a Kilmarnock or someone, but <laughs> definitely for a Rangers game, we're definitely getting up at 4 a.m. We're, we're on a night out for that one. We'll, we'll definitely get together for an old fun game or a cup game or something. Yeah. No, it's, it, sounds, it sounds incredible that you could just get up and at 4 a.m. Celtics playing. It's, I, I couldn't imagine that um, kind of staying here, but it just becomes normal, I suppose, for you guys. It's just the way it is. Well, when LA it was like that as well. I mean, there was a place called Jocks or Dailies, which was in Culver City, and we all kind of used to just meet down there. And this has gone back quite a few years ago, but you know, it started getting a bit tricky because uh, Culver City to West Hollywood, it's you know, it's a good 15, 20 minute drive, mm-hmm. um, it's maybe twenty minute drive, and you know, you can't have a drink, and you know, and then you're calling Ubers and all that, and. Then, it's a bit much at that time of night kind of thing, but if it was an old fun game, you'd, you'd make the effort, but, you know, just turning up for, you know, Celtic Dundee or something, you wouldn't, you wouldn't bother. <laughs> just watch your house. Speaking of playing, um, of watching Celtic, you've actually had the, the the chance to pull on the hoops on a couple of occasions now in the charity matches. Um, I think it was the first one at East End Park. That's right, aye. 2015. So how did that come about and what was kind of going through your mind when you were pulling on the hoops? Well, uh, you know, there's two two pulling factors to this, but, you know, Celtic Foundation are behind it and um, Celtic Foundation do amazing, amazing things. Mm-hmm. Um, they're just, you know, Tony Hamilton and, you know, Chris Trainer out there, they just do great, great things and they, you know, they raise so much money for, char- you know, they've got their own charities to choose from and, you know, obviously Celtic back it, um, and uh, you know it's a legitimate, legitimate 
cause and they just you know they don't get they don't make money off of this they they raise money just to help the people and that's what you know Celtic was all about and why Celtic was created if you remember back by brother Walfred and you know it's food, it's food, food and tables for people and you know and that's really what they do so they organized this game and um and absolutely you're are you, are you ever going to turn down an opportunity to put on the hoops and absolutely, uh, not. absolutely not you know so when I get asked to play by the foundation I was over the moon and um you know and and it was a great day out you know and the family come along and you know I think it was only maybe I don't know maybe five and a half thousand folk there or some to watch the game and mm-hmm. it was brilliant and you know Martin was there and and Murdo was the he was appointed manager of the day um but I it was just it was a really 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 good day I think I came on for Petrop or something like that or you know it's just not a bad swap I was a not bad <laughs> it was a terrible swap you're a Celtic fan <laughs> but uh, and I remember it was half time it was just such a great experience to be in the changing room and you know Chris Sutton's winding everybody up and you know again it, it's just one of those there's just so much to it in the changing room and the the banter in there is just second to none and it's you know you're sitting there you're talking about being nervous on a on a film set you're I think that was the most nervous I've ever been sitting in that you know and um I think the only three actors were myself, James McAvoy and Martin. And um, it was just, I don't know, that's the most, I mean, I was more worried at that day than, than, than being on any movie set or meeting anyone in my life. Uh, you know, I think I, I try to train as much as possible to get in shape because <laughs> I just don't have any stamina at all at the time. And, you know, I don't, I don't really train much. So uh, I didn't want to make a complete asset. Um, but it was brilliant, absolute brilliant, brilliant day. And I remember it was nil nil at half time, and um, it, the Murdo had stuck with the players, like the the, the former players at the time. Yep. And um, you know, I think I think the foundation said, Murdo, you need to get some of the <laughs> you get actors on there." Right? <laughs> and as soon as we came on, we were losing two nil. So. <laughs> I don't think Murdo was <laughs> but uh, I, it was just a brilliant, brilliant day. And, you know, it's like one of those days where you just never, ever forget. And you can remember all these different wee moments about it. And, you know, it's it's just fantastic. I remember uh, Martin and I, our missus, were there. And uh, we were up trying to see them and we saw, saw them were waving. And Murdo was shouting, you know, a couple of tourists, get back up here. <laughs> He's so professional, you know. He's like, get all back up here. He's taking everyone so seriously, and uh, so you know, it's wee th- small things like that, just wee quick things like that, that just kind of you remember. And um, I, and I, you know, the only and then you'll think that we saying this was brilliant, and then the only thing you taught that is playing at Parkhead because it's you know you've got the hoops on and all that, but it's you know and, you, and you're you're playing with Petrov and Sutton and. You know, everybody you grew up with watching and and then suddenly you're like, well, it's no parkhead, but it, I mean, I'll do with this. I'll sell it with this. This is brilliant. Uh, definitely. And definitely. then, yeah, and then they had that game, uh, Lubos against Henrik, Henrik's Heroes and Lubos Legends. And I got a call for that uh, by the foundation. And um, I was just, I was like, wow, this is, you know, you're, if you think you're nervous there, walk out in front of 60 odd thousand fans and you're you know there's no way to hide in that park no. so you know uh, it's just it was probably one of the best days of my life you know like and you say that and you have kids and it's up there with it you know and you're married obviously in case my wife listens to this <laughs> I'm hoping the wife's not listening at the moment <laughs> um, it just really is it's just walking down that tunnel and again, the dressing room, and it was just, it was, you know, it was Celtic versus Celtic. It was just a, you know, they came in and we went in their change room and they came in our change room. And, you know, after it, before it, you know, we all had breakfast before it. And then, you know, we all went out after it together. They had their organised a wee event for us after it. Mm-hmm. And it was, it was just, you know, you're speechless, you know, you're, you're playing with Lubo and Henrik. Yeah. And I don't know how 
can it get any better than that? You know, you're just, it's a different, you know, it's a completely, completely different feeling and you really feel part of a family. And I think after that day, like you just feel inbred till you die, you're part of that family. And, you know, and it was a family, not just, a, you know, 30 odd players or 40 players that day, but a, a family of, you know, 60 odd thousand people in that one stadium, just everybody's part of your family. And that's just the way I see, you know, Celtic support and the club. You know, yeah. you're all under one umbrella and yeah. you all want the common thing and that's your team to do well. And, you know, and the fans are important, the players are important, the club's important, and everybody, kit man's important, everybody's important for that club. So, you know, we go through hard times together and we go through good times together. You know, I, you know, I was around when Rangers were absolutely smashing us and dominating Scottish football with the Teddy Butchers and all them and Chris Woods and, you know, the Gazes. Mm. And, you know, we go through those moments and we come out the other side and, and now it's our turn to dominate. And, you know, that for me, that day was the day that really, how can I say, you're, you know, you're, Celt, for me, Celtic, till you die, you'll go through anything. And, and that's just, you know, it's just one of those things. And, you know, and I, and I travel a lot with Celtic sometimes. And when I'm home, I, if I'm back here, I can, I'll go to as many away European games as possible. Or, you know, uh, this year I went to Copenhagen, I was in Rome. Um, if I can, I, I'm, if I'm here, I'll definitely go. Um, and, you know, we're all in it together and, you know, we're all side by side. And, I think that's one of the things I really enjoy about away games uh, in Europe. You're just you're you're all together in it. You're just part of it, you know, side by side. So it's interesting that we touch on the Henrik Heroes and the Lubos Legends match because the whole build up to that day was just incredible. The week before, we'd been totally celebrating the 50th anniversary of the Lisbon Lions. I actually travelled over to Lisbon, and there was about 10,000 Celtic fans there. Um, wow. Just a, it was a party for the whole week. The weather was absolutely beautiful, and there were some great things put on by the foundation. People had cycled to Lisbon, um, and then actually getting to go to the stadium on the the day of the anniversary, it was absolutely incredible. To then come back and have the invincible treble secured on the Saturday and the sellout legends game on the Sunday, it was just that week was probably the most perfect Celtic week there could be. And I think, obviously, you were playing in the Legends game. You must have felt the sort of the aura around the club at that point. It was just invincible was the word. You just felt everybody was a winner. Everybody felt like winners. Fans, um, players, everybody felt like winners. And and I remember Scott Brown, Scott Brown played in that game too. Um, and they were just so buoyant. It was just, you know, grin. And I remember Kieran Tierney came down just to meet Henrik that game as well. It was just everybody was just in great, great spirits. Honestly, I've got a wee small video I took and it just of the crowd when you were out there and from the touchline and it's it's unbelievable looking up at so many fans in one stadium like when you're on that park. It was just it was just brilliant. It was it was euphoric and you know, there wasn't one piece in it and it doesn't matter if you played well or no well. I mean, I remember chasing a ball with Neil Lennon and running, 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 running. And uh, we get to it and clears it. And I'm, I'm walking up to Neil after running down after chasing this ball and he turns around and just throws up. You know, <laughs> and it was like, I patted him on the back. And I was like, I says, thank fuck it's you and it's not me. Because <laughs> I was so close to throwing up as well. <laughs> so, but it was just, it was like one of those ones where you know it doesn't matter if you your side lost ten nil or hundred. It doesn't matter. It was just it was just great to be part of, and that's what it was all about. These charity matches, Celtic hold them now on pretty much a regular basis. There's, there's probably one every year now, and I know obviously the one for MND Scotland was cancelled this year due to the coronavirus. Were you going to be part of that or? Uh, the foundation spoke to me about it, and um, they spoke to me, but said it's probably it might not happen because of the coronavirus. So I kind of knew there's there's a good chance of the thing being stopped. But yeah. I don't think I think they do one every couple of years. I think as they try and do it every two years. It's something that really brings the fans together. I mean, I, I don't know of many other teams that can sell out a stadium to watch guys that are kind of retired 10, 15 years alongside some celebrities like yourself and even com- competition winners and sponsors, and they sell out over and over again. So I think, I, I don't know if you would agree with me, but it's certainly a Celtic thing, this, that we can raise this money for charity and there's still that affection from the, the fan base for um, the ex-players and the celebs. 
Well, I think at the end of the day, people remember what Celtic's all about. And, you know, again, Celtic was created to help the community. So I think it's important that if we're winners on the park, we're still winners off the park. And, and that's what I think everybody recognises. And listen, if we can do the smallest thing, whether it's contribute a tenner or contribute five quid or an afternoon of your time, then that's what, and that helps folk then, you know, why not do it? You know, it can't just be there for the glory. We also need, you know, we have a commitment and that's what the reason that the club was formed for. So I think everybody enjoys it. So Celtic fans are one of the most generous fans, I think, you'll find. And they're, they're very well behaved when they travel abroad. Yeah, I honestly rarely see anything happening when I'm a an hour away abroad. And they're just... Yeah, and I, think, I think that's, that's a really nice way to round round that up with the, the sort of charity aspect. So just a, a couple more things before we, we close out. Um, you mentioned um, getting the chance to go away to some games this season. I was actually in Rome as well, and I, I've got to say, for me, that's my highlight of the season, was winning Cham chips the ball over the goalkeeper. But for yourself, what would, what's been your highlight of the season so far? I think Rome as well. Rome, that Rome trip, I mean, I used to go away to the trips when we played Juventus and Valencia and, you know, I've been to Ajax a couple of times. Like, But that Rome trip for me was probably the best trip I've ever been on. And I think it has to be the highlight of the season as well. I mean, we've never won on Italian soil. And, you know, Lazio are no mugs. They're, you know, they're, they're a good team. And, you know, yeah, there's a perception in Italy that Italian teams don't really try for the Europa League because there's, there's not really a lot of money in it for them and they'd rather be in the Champions League and all that. But still, it doesn't really matter. It's not as if they, they still had great players out in their team and, you know, I do generally think that they actually tried. I think once they could beat by Celtic, then that was their Europa League kind of over, you know. But I think they won the next game against the French mob. But when Cham chipped that ball, honestly, I don't think there was a moment, if you remember, that he kind of, every, kind of looked at each other as if to say, is that a goal? Like, Yep. There was a moment of disbelief. You know, are we going to get called offside now? Or nobody could, we just couldn't believe it. Like, and it couldn't t- believe that it's actually in the net. Is that in the net? Like, you're double, <laughs> you're, you're having to ask. And, and then, obviously, the eruption is the confirmation of it, the eruption of fans. And, you know, it was just, it was brilliant. And, you know, I, I was at, did you go to the, the Irish pub? The, no, we, we stayed in the, the city centre. I see where you get dropped off with the buses. Right. Actually, just about two seconds away from there. And we went back to our hostel that we were staying in. This this hostel was incredible. It basically took up the whole street. had its own nightclub and stuff. So with all the security lockdowns it was on, we ended up staying in that sort of nightclub. Um, but I've seen some of the, the videos from the Irish bars. Uh, one of our uh, recent podcasts was with some of the fans that were over there. And the pictures and the videos just looked incredible. It was, it was just, for me, definitely my favourite trip that I've been away on. I mean, you have to admit, that Papa Francesco song, I think it rang in my ears months after that night. I don't think I'll ever forget that song. I think that, for me, that song is, well, if you pick one song that reminded you of Rome, it had to be the Papa Francesco song, but unbelievable, like, that we went, I went back to the, the pub where the two boys got stabbed the previous night, and that, for me, was the safest place you could be in Rome that night, because yeah. the police were there after the night before, outside, and... And inside, it was just, it was carnage inside. It was just absolutely amazing. I mean, we were, I remember they sold beer. And the funny thing was, going to Rome, they says, oh, there's going to be lockdowns. You can't even drink 10 hours before the game and all that stuff. They were, do you remember where you get the buses from? They were selling. The wee park in the, the wee place oh. that was selling the beers, aye? Aye, they were selling beers there. So, I mean, you had beers there. You, you take beers on the bus. You bought beer at the the ground Stadium, yep. you're in the game they were selling beers as you're walking back to the bus <laughs> I mean it was just incredible and it was wee things like do you remember where the, where we got the buses from did you see the boy that climbed the tree to get the football down yes I mean it's things like that that you just remember you know and you're there and you're like you can't, I mean I honestly thought that boy was going to fall because if he fell he's landing on concrete right. I've got that video it's absolutely crazy but uh, he must have been a professional tree climber or something <laughs> there's no the way he was hugging that climbing up that tree was just ridiculous honestly I thought I was like oh god this guy's going to die because he's going to fall in concrete it's going to be, for the sake of a two pound plastic football and it was just oh but things like that just there's so many amazing memories and that was the best trip and we just missed we were in a bar the night before I was in the ice bar but we just missed uh, 
it was one of the other bars that got attacked and the guy pulled the shutters down and yep. we were in that one actually and we just left it. Oh, it must have been less than 20 minutes before it got attacked and uh, the night before. So we just, just missed it. But I mean, apart from a few of the Lazio fans who were idiots, but, it, you know, nothing could dampen that trip away. It was just brilliant, absolutely brilliant. And the, the bar that you're talking about, one of the guys reading the podcast recently, Kevin Maguire, he was he was the person that videoed it that night when the shutters get pulled down and the staff. I've got to say, all the Italians that we met, certainly when we were over there, were certainly more than welcoming. And even some of the Lazio fans that we ended up bumping into, they were really nice people, I think. The ultras, of the fans really turned on the ultras for the way that they behaved, because I don't think that summed up the way that most Lazio fans felt at all. Yeah, I spoke to a guy that actually I worked with on a movie in Italy, and he was a Lazio fan, and he was there that day. And uh, he was, you know, he basically said the same thing. There's a big division between the ultras and the fans at Lazio, um, and some of them just take it far too left wing or right wing, but yeah. whatever wing it is, it's just far too much. And um, they go over the, over the top. Well, you know, and it's funny because sometimes we have that as well at Celtic Park. I feel, you know, I always think the Green Brigade have been brilliant and they do great things, you know, for the club. And I do, but there's always a, a moment every now and then that you're going to find controversy with things that they see and then other fans. And, you know, it's just when you have 60,000 fans or however many people that you'll have, you'll always have different views. Yeah. You know, like if you remember correctly, I think I ran in a bit of bother recently because. Well, not recently, but it was a wee while back. I think, what was it? Well, obviously, I think Rod Stewart got in trouble with the Tories, right? He got in trouble with the Tories. But do you remember when the Green Brigade had the banner up about the SNP? Uh, yeah, towards the start of the season. Right, so, I mean, I, I voted SNP, and if you don't vote SNP, they don't want you, they don't like SNP and they don't like Tories. I didn't, I'm not voting Labour. And, you know, it doesn't mean I'll ever vote Labour, but not this time round, I wouldn't vote Labour. So, you know then you get into this conversation where, well, you know, you can't hammer everybody just for, you know, it's like a, a difference of opinion on politics and things like that. And sometimes we lose, you know, we kind of lose our focus and our goal. And our, the main focus is, you know, Celtic Football Club rather than politics and things like that. And I think that's what happens with the, the Lazio fans. Going back to that, it's some of them, some of them have different views and opinions than most of the fans. And, you know, so, but I, that, that for me is a highlight. Back to what you said, that's the highlight of, of the year for me as well. I mean, I've got to say so as well. It just, I don't know about you, but I think I watched that clip back about a hundred times the next morning, and I was away with with some of my pals, and we all got up at different times. But as we got up, everyone's putting their phone on just to make sure that ball did go over the line, and then, <laughs> it, it it definitely did happen. It was just, it was such a great trip, and hopefully, once this is all over and everything's died down, we'll. Lots more of these trips to look forward to going forward next season. But yeah, for, for this year, it's definitely got to be uh, Lazio away. But I think that is that must have been the best. I mean, that achievement alone ranks right up there. You know, yeah. I know it's not a final. And, and Copenhagen was really disappointing. I've got to be honest with you. Our game at home at Copenhagen was, for me, was absolutely dire. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know if a bottle crashed or what. I don't know what happened in that. But, you know, we did all right away as well, wasn't it? You know, we did the club proud away. But, aye, we just cra- crashed at home. Yeah, definitely. And, I mean, it's been fantastic getting the chance over the last hour or so, Gianni, to talk to you about Celtic. And I think we could go on for another couple of hours, but we don't want to, don't want to have the listeners dragging on and <laughs> sitting here three hours later and we're still <laughs> no, right. all across the line. I'm getting, a, I'm, getting a, I'm getting a break from a three-year-old, so... <laughs> <laughs> but honestly, Gianni, thank you for taking the time out to, to talk with us today. It's been an absolute pleasure to have you on a Celtic State of Mind. Tell the listeners, where can they see you at the moment? Where can they find you? Uh, well, if you can find a movie called Hell on the Border, it's a movie I did with Ron. It's a great Western. Um, or even try and find River Runs Red, which is a, the movie I did with uh, Cusack and Hemsworth. Two decent movies that... I'm pretty proud of so and there's certainly plenty of time for for people to catch up on these at the moment as we're all stuck indoors so i'm sure a lot of them seen robert the bruce but again i think daniel and i just came in the last 10 15 minutes of it so to those last 10 15 minutes to catch gianni you also see him in an episode of still game alongside marty comston just check out his stuff he's a fantastic actor we're privileged to have him today and gianni once again thank you for for joining us on a celtic state of mind god bless you and uh, keep safe and stay home hail 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 